Hi there, and welcome back to the Cypher Brief series on artificial intelligence. I'm Suzanne Kelly here with our COO, Brad Christian, and of course, most of you know our CMO, Alicia Volpe, as well. It's a pleasure to have you with us. We are all nerding out over today's session, really looking forward to digging into artificial intelligence and what it means. And I probably shouldn't be this excited when I think about these issues, but I do mean we're nerding out. It's such an important part of where we're going when you think about the future of US national security and understanding it and understanding how the government is thinking about implementing AI are gonna be really important questions from here forward. Um, you know, we are so pleased to have had the opportunity as well to bring you this incredible series since January of this year. We've heard from former PDDNI Susan Gordon. We've heard from Dr. Jason Matheny, who's now serving in a variety of AI related roles at the White House for the Biden administration. We've heard from former Congressman Will Hurd. We've heard from several members of the Commission on AI during this series, including Katerina McFarland and Gilman Louie. We've heard from Lieutenant General Michael Grohn, who's the commander of the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. We've also heard from Dr. Stacey Dixon, who is the Biden administration's nominee, as many of you already know, to become the next Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence. And we're hearing directly today from three of the most influential intelligence agencies in the United States, the CIA, the NSA, and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, more lovingly known as NGA. Uh, Microsoft Federal has been a fantastic partner in helping make sure that we were able to bring you this incredible series on AI. So with that, I'd like to welcome Joe Schmank for some opening comments. Now, Joe is the principal manager for Microsoft's Azure Cloud Engineering team. He joined Microsoft in 2015 after a 33-year U.S. government career at the Central Intelligence Agency. The Microsoft Cloud team that he is now with enables mission across all U.S. government classification levels, including the use of advanced artificial intelligence, data analytic, and other capabilities. Mr. Schmidt rounded out his CIA career, serving concurrently as the director of what is now the CIA Center for Cyber Intelligence and as the CIA Director Senior Advisor on Cyber. In this role, Mr. Schmank was responsible for integrating advanced cyber capabilities into all of CIA's mission areas. I feel like this is a much better way to understand when we hear from the experts, the breadth and the level and the depth of expertise they have on these issues. Um, so Joe, welcome. Thanks so much for being here and for helping the Cypher Brief make this series possible. Awesome, uh, thank you, Suzanne. It's a pleasure and I'm thrilled to represent Microsoft today in our sponsorship throughout this past year. This has been an incredible uh, seminar and series of, of uh, panels uh, that you've you've hosted, and, and Microsoft's really thrilled to have been involved along the way. As a corporation, Microsoft's committed to the U.S. government and national security community, ensuring um, the best of our capabilities that the company can offer is available to the missions represented uh, in this discussion. Um, the series, as you noted, started with my good friend Sue Gordon, Dr. Jason Matheny, and and uh, we'll end today with these incredible uh, panelists uh, that we have today and some, some really close friends, and so I appreciate that. Um, the topic of national security use of uh, AI and artificial intelligence is an important com component, really, of our national dialogue uh, and inside of Microsoft as well, of course. And uh, this series is addressed in a number of different angles, from policy to legislative, uh, obviously technological and ethical. Um, and I think uh, in combination, you can't address the topic without uh, thinking through all of that. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, I'd like to emphasize Microsoft's continued commitment to the public-private partnership that enables the intelligence and defense communities of our nation to use Microsoft's most advanced AI technologies in appropriate ways for these missions. Um, with the foundation of Microsoft's global available hyperscale cloud and technology, uh, set we call the Azure Cloud. Um, in partnership with the U.S. government, Microsoft's invested to ensure that our most advanced capabilities, AI, data analytics, cybersecurity, and others, are available uh, and to be used across all classification levels of the U.S. government information, from unclassified data to the most sensitive information. Uh, the mission advantage comes through integrating these capabilities together in Microsoft's Azure Hyperscale Cloud 
uh, computing environment. And, and really, in my time in government, we didn't have this uh, uh, array of capabilities available to us. And so AI really was not yet something that we could um, ha or we even had a dialogue on. Mm -hmm. uh, so in closing, really, uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to participate in this dialogue as Microsoft uh, and to enable the government's most important missions through the use of these technologies. And I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. And it's so great to see several old friends on the panel. Thank you. Joe, thank you so much. We really appreciate it as well. Um, we definitely, if you are new to the Cypher Brief, then it might be news to you that we really focus a lot on that intersection between public and private. Um, for those who know us, you already know that this is a huge area of focus for us as we move forward. So Joe, thank you so much. Um, please feel free to jump into the conversation at any time. We would love to hear your questions. Awesome. All right. Well, with that, I would like to uh, get a few logistics out of the way for Joe and everybody else who has questions they'd like to send in. Um, you can send them using the chat box, which is in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. Please get them in early because we already have a number of folks who have sent their questions in and I'd like to make sure we get to as many as possible. If the chat box function isn't quite working out for you um, or you're a little logistically challenged like I can be at times, uh, you could also email them to brad at bchristian at thecipherbrief.com. Um, we do have members of the media who are on the call today and this is an on the record session. Um, so please let us know if you have any issues, concerns, questions after the briefing, we're always happy to help as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce our guests. Neil Higgins is Associate Deputy Director of CIA for Digital Innovation. For those who don't know, the Directorate of Digital Innovation was founded at the CIA in 2015 with the mission of accelerating the integration of digital capabilities across all of CIA's mission areas. So they're responsible for cyber intelligence, open source collection, data governments, data science, secure global communications, and worldwide mission information systems. Jason Wang is the Technical Director for National Security Agency's Computer and Analytic Sciences Research Organization. I now know why the government uses acronyms so much. He's focused <laughs> on shaping NSA's research portfolio to advance data science methods, scalable trade craft, which I'm sure is something we'll talk about today, and machine learning for all of NSA's core missions. Now, his career at NSA has spanned across technology department, research, and operations. And Rachel Martin is currently the lead for artificial intelligence, automation, and augmentation at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Rachel is the agency's chief proponent for implementation of these activities. And as such, she's looking at accelerating the speed at which NGA provides insight to refine the precision of geoint assessments. Rachel's efforts drive NGA's framework in coordination and alignment with the Department of Defense and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. So those true insiders know that NGA really provides both of those clients with intelligence information. So welcome everyone. This is so fun. I'm so excited to welcome you. Thank you, Suzanne. It's good to be with you. Um, let me start out by asking each of you, if I can, to share some insights into how each of your respective agencies is looking at the implementation of and the development of artificial intelligence as we look to the future of U.S. national security. Um, Neil, can we start with you? Sure, thank you, and it's good to be with you today. Um, at CIA, we see artificial intelligence as central to the future of our business and our ability to provide policymakers with the intelligence and insights they require. Uh, we're already putting AI to use in a variety of applications, uh, from the triage, transcription, and translation of foreign language materials, to the management of our networks, to rapid data exploitation to inform operations in real time. Uh, we're also developing predictive analytics to detect and mitigate both counterintelligence uh, and cybersecurity threats. That's what we're doing with AI, um, but I think the real question is how do we get there? Um, for us, the first step is building the infrastructure that lays the foundation for AI, which starts with our migration uh, to the cloud, a single cloud solution for the time being, um, but in the near future to a multi-cloud solution. Um, from there, the next question is the data. And I think any conversation about AI really needs to start with a conversation about the data, uh, how we collect it, how we process it, and how we exploit it. In the technology world, you often hear reference to the fourth industrial revolution. The first was driven by steam, the second by electricity, 
the third by the personal computer in the late 20th century, and the fourth by data, data that's growing exponentially from an explosion of connected devices transmitted over global high-speed networks to software optimized data centers known as the cloud, where massive amounts of compute and cutting edge algorithms uh, produce previously unimaginable solutions, everything from real-time translation on your smartphone uh, to self-driving cars. When we talk about AIML, that's what we're really talking about, right? The, the foundation, the infrastructure, the data, uh, and then getting the algorithms in um, with enough data to test and train them. If you're in the private sector, um, you have a few advantages that we don't in the IC. Um, your customers may voluntarily provide the data in fields that you define, uh, in the same language, free of malware, uh, you transmit it over the internet to the commercial cloud, and you wind up with enough reliable data to, tain, to train and test your algorithms. In our world, things are a little bit different. The data we collect in pursuit of our foreign intelligence mission comes in all sorts of formats and all sorts of languages, and we have to transport, store, and process it all in our secure ecosystem. Um, as I say, we've made big strides in that direction with our migration to the cloud, and we're getting our data right, uh, and hiring and developing the AI-ready workforce um, that we need to put AI uh, at the center of our business. Uh, and frankly, that can't happen fast enough. There's a tsunami of data coming at us, and if we don't learn how to surf, um, we're gonna drown. Uh, we need to let the computers burn through the haystacks so that the humans can focus on the needles, performing the higher order cognitive functions uh, where they add the most value. Um, if we don't rapidly adopt AI technologies, we risk, we risk either uh, wasting resources searching for answers that we already possess, or worse, not realizing that we had the answers um, until after something bad has already happened. Um, so from our perspective, succeeding in our national security mission requires us to develop, test, and train, and deploy AI solutions across all aspects of our mission uh, as rapidly as we can. Excellent, Neil. Thank you so much, so much for that. Um, Jason, how about the NSA? How are you thinking about artificial intelligence and the future of U.S. national security? So, uh, at the NSA, you know, I think with most of our sort of industry and academic counterparts, our, our journey started in this the space of natural language processing and computer vision. Uh, you know, applying capabilities like you know machine transcription, machine translation, image classification to to our our mission problems. Um, in over this last decade, there was a lot of hyperbole associated with that that AI journey of you know getting to sort of superhuman capabilities on AI, and really I think that was just sort of a, a statement of there are things that computers are better than than, than people at you know things like uh, precision and measurements, things like aggregated statistics, things like like data recall. So uh, our part of our journey over this this past decade has been kind of maturing that sort of harnessing the data, harnessing data at scale to apply to our mission and being able to extend some of these out, these initial outcomes from natural language processing, computer vision to our core missions. Things like power spectrum you know, uh, estimations are images that, you know, we are able to apply computer vision to our RF signal triage mission. Things like um, system and uh, machine logs are you know forms of communication that we've been able to apply natural language processing to our cybersecurity triage mission so uh we we've been able to sort of extend you know from kind of research outcomes of ai into mission applications and really what that has enabled us to do over this past decade has been to build this environment of uh building sort of this culture of adoption and trust to where we can have sort of an, an AI conversation with our analysts and our decision makers and our policy makers in ways that are, you know, a little bit beyond theoretical. We can have some, some empirical discussions of, you know, how do we shape policy and governance discussions on, on frameworks like these. So uh, that was, you know, what sort of got us here. As we look ahead to where do we extend our mission, um, you know, there's this cycle of data refinement, right, of, uh, data to information and so that, that's kind of where we've been of you know we have you know sort of this uh uh large scale uh, in, in you know information dynamic uh, that that drives our collection and sort of turning that that sort of raw data into something that our analysts can use has been that, that sort of initial push of natural language processing computer vision this this sort of triage mission 
Um, so data to information, we're, we're sort of there. Now as we move from information to knowledge, how do we take these processes that we've been maturing and start to do the, the next order of analysis, driving things like recommendation systems, uh, you know, shaping how our analysts can approach their data or their information, um, to how do we shape and, and augment their their day to day activities through workflow recommendations and things like that. Um, as we increase the complexity of how we apply uh, AIML here in in our mission, that drives sort of what we need to do in the foundations of the AIML work. So things like getting down to explainability of AI systems or being able to to, to bring provable assurance of the AI uh, systems that we're deploying. These are sort of the next areas of, of work that, that we'll focus on. But it's been super useful having, you know, a, a, a workable environment that we can sort of exercise these kinds of discussions as we sort of focus on really the, the next thing is um, as uh, looking ahead to this intersection of maturing AI systems, our uh, human analysts, our decision makers, and how do we drive that human machine teaming in an effective way that uh, uh, really is, um, you know, sort of takes advantage again of the, the things that uh, humans are best at, coupled with the things that machines are best at. So that is our push here at NSA. I, I think that's a uh, fantastic uh, insight into sort of how NSC is thinking about this. Um, Rachel, NGA has long been a leader in sort of government mapping the world and leading the way. Um, how do you? How can you tell us that NGA is thinking about using now artificial intelligence to sort of help um, implement its mission to provide, you know, mapping intelligence to DOD and into the intelligence community. Yeah, so I, you know, uh, I feel like Neil and Jason covered a lot of a lot of the 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 points that I would probably have brought up. So I'll try and try and give this a little bit more of a geoint flavor. Um, you know, if if you look at uh, NGA's current strategy, um, what the director calls his moonshot strategy, um, the the underpinnings of that, um, our mission imperatives are all of them without with without exception built on assumptions about our ability to automate um, and deploy ai to speed the the timeline between um you know uh, data data collection and decision and um you know it, it's you know called different you know things in different areas but you know the whole sensor to shooter comp uh, concept or join all domain right how do we how do we take what is an increasing volume of of data from not really not just government systems, but all the commercial data that's now available um, from you know from from satellites. It's it's really um, you know you say we can't surf, but I'm pretty sure it's a tidal wave that's going to you know drown the entire city if we if we don't get you know wrap our hands around it. Um, we are rapidly approaching the point where you know asking for more information does does nothing because we can barely manage you know to process the information that we have. So uh, for us, AI isn't isn't something that we need to do. It's something we have to do uh, if we're going to be able to meet mission in the future and and hold adversaries at risk. Um, and you know, so there's a lot of different ways that we're looking at that. You know, there there is you know partnership with our industry, you know, industry partners. We, you know, and that's when we're looking at the commercial solutions. Um, that's especially true when you look at foundation. You know, foundation geoint. Um, we did some great um, sprint work over COVID, where we actually were able to you know deploy some some AWS solutions uh, to meet some some needs, um, even though we were working from home. So there's there's a ton of commercial space out there where where we know there's answers and we know that there's solutions that we can incorporate. I think the other area, you know, that we're, we're really looking is, um, is, as Neil kind of alluded to, is how do we get our hands around all the data that we have? Because it's not just the data we have coming in. If we want to get to insight, if we want to get to knowledge, we need to look at the data we've had for, you know, 20, 30 years in the past, right? Mm -hmm. That's the, that's mm -hmm. the um, oil well that we need to dig into. Um, but, but doing that, right, that's, you know, they say data is 80% of the AI problem. It, it might be more than that for us because, um, you know, if you want to go back and derive insight from that data, you have to have an effort, a workforce, a you know, a focus on labeling it and, and managing it and getting it ready for, for it to actually be used in any kind of you know uh, deployed model. Uh, and so that that for us is, is a challenge because the big. It's big. It's big data uh, mm -hmm. in the truest sense of the word. Uh, so we're we're trying to understand how we can um, how we can better manage that process and um, really 
get past some of that. This is my telework buddy. You can all see right here. Get, <laughs> get past um, get past some of the tech debt, right, that we have from 30 years of, of, of investing in a, in a range of different systems that may not be compatible with, you know, AI, AI solutions. Um, so then I guess I, my, my final point I'd make would you also sort of touch on some of what, what Jason also alluded to is how do we then make sure that all these things that we're building and investing in are, are um, you know, that they're they're safe, that we trust them, that there's governance built in. And that's not really just mission governance, you know, that we're, ha we're, we're comfortable with the risk we're taking in using AI in any given decision space, but uh, that we understand the technical implications of using that, that AI as well. And so there's a whole second part of the story, you know, beyond um, managing mission, right, managing mission risk to understanding uh, the, the technical aspects of actually operationally using AI. Uh, that's operational in the sense of everyday work or whether it's actually operational like you're 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 deploying it to the field and you know you want someone to be able to use it operationally um, and you know that respect and combat support agencies so we're, we're vitally interested in being able to share whatever we build um, to share our ecosystem to share our models to be able to work seamlessly with the services and the combatant commands because at the end of the day um, you know they're the ones that that are going to be um, at that edge and have to have to leverage the information we're providing uh, for for decision advantage yeah Thank you. I think that's excellent. And we already have a number of questions rolling in. So I'm going to get right to one from um, the former director of national intelligence, Jim Clapper, who has a question for each of you. He has three questions for each of you. So um, you might want to jot these down. The first is, um, what do each of you feel is the most promising application of artificial intelligence in your mission space? The second is, what role do you feel the ODNI should play in overseeing the application of AI? Which is a really important question when you look back to cloud and how the intelligence community really had to come together to figure out how they were going to coordinate using um, cloud capabilities. And are there metrics that can be used to measure the impact of AI? Which I think is a fantastic question. And if you can tell us that, I'll just throw on the one, do aliens really exist? Because it might be about as easy to answer. That's the metric one. But Neil, let's start with you. Um, most promising application of AI in your mission space? Yeah, well, first of all, it's, it's great to hear from Director Clapper. Um, I think the most promising immediate application and the one that might yield the most benefit um, across the IC in the short term is natural language processing or human language technology. Um, the ability to sort through um, massive amounts of foreign language material, whether that's open source material or, or classified holdings, um, and to, to triage, um, translate, transcribe um, all of that data. I think that's where um, there's sort of immediate and high uh, return on investment. Um, and there's a lot of good work being done um, in the private sector um, that, we can, that we can leverage. Sometimes doing that in our own classified ecosystem is a little more complicated. Um, but I think that's sort of, to me, the most the most promising immediate application. Um, in terms of the ODNI's role, the ODNI's um, Augmenting Intelligence with Machines initiative, um, I think has played a, a central role in coordinating in sort of a hub and spoke fashion across the intelligence community, um, making sure that we are making the foundational investments uh, in artificial intelligence that we as a community need, um, that everyone um, are playing to their strengths uh, and supporting the whole community uh, while also fulfilling their own their own mission. Um, so I think there is an important role um, for ODI and I to play, and one that they've that they've taken the lead on, um, including with investments across the IC um, in those uh, AIML foundations. Um, metrics on impact, you know, assessing impact is is always complicated. Um, you know, I think for us, um, I don't want to put quantitative metrics on, but I think um, from a qualitative perspective, if we're able to adopt AI solutions that are transparent to the user, um, where they're running federated searches across data sets and there are recommender engines in there um, that are going out and finding the data that they need, um, but it's transparent, you know, that's one measure of success. I think if we have high levels of assurance in the answers that we're getting back from the algorithms, that they are explainable one way or another. That would be uh, another measure of success. Uh, a third would be whether we're able to put the policy and governance framework in place that we need to make sure that we are using AIML solutions appropriately, that we're using them in the right context against the right problems, um, and that we, uh, that we can explain to, to our oversight 
um, and to the American public to the extent we can, how it is that we're deploying AI ML. I think if we're able to do all of that, um, those will be indicators of success, which may be a little bit of a dodge, but, uh, yeah. but that's what I would offer. No, I think it's fantastic. And I think the oversight uh, question is an important one um, as you're thinking about the use of this, because um, I, you know it's it's easy to understand how we can get too far down a road um, in this country before we realize something should have been baked in from the beginning. Jason, you were nodding your head um, a lot when Neil was speaking. Um, how about you in, in terms of the most promising application of AI for NSA, what might that look like? And then the ODNI role. And of course, I think the one that you are most excited about was how are you going to measure these things? What are the metrics? Yeah. <laughs> right now, I was actually most excited about the aliens. Um, so, uh, you know, on our side, we'll we'll say natural language processing is a solved problem. No, actually, actually that, that, uh, a little tongue in cheek. <laughs> so, um, I, I actually think, I mean, we, we do have a lot of investment in natural language processing. That is sort of where we've uh, really matured and, and refined uh, our uh, uh, sort of AI uh, frameworks. Um, I, I think the, the next frontier for us uh, is probably in the cybersecurity space. And I think there's there's a lot of opportunity in uh, being able to bring sort of machines to this very low latency, sort of highly dynamic problem in ways that really just are, these are not sort of human time kinds of problems. And so um, that is a, a space that um, uh, we, we've got uh, efforts underway that I, I think uh, we would love to, uh, to mature with, uh, along with our partners. Um, I think speaking of, of that partnership, so uh, DNI, uh, we've been uh, working alongside as, as partners with the uh, Augmenting Intelligence with uh, Machines initiative, the, the uh, ODNI, um, AI machine learning driven uh, initiative. Uh, one of the things I think uh, we love to see, and, and uh, DNI is already sort of underpinning, are uh, things like, uh, and, and Joe alluded to in his opening of you know driving some of the standards of how we apply AI ML between our agencies, uh, shaping some of this ethics discussion, which uh, the DNI has has already driven over these these last two years, uh, mm -hmm. and and really to uh, shape that to the, the comments that, that Rachel made. Data is under underpins the, the core of our AI challenges, and we really need to come together as uh, multiple agencies working across our multiple authorities uh, in ways that we can sort of partner uh, partner with each other in ways that our data is interchangeable uh, across you know the the relative authorities that we have. Our algorithms are interchangeable and shareable. We can. Uh, have better understanding of really what are the capabilities of our partners so we can sort of bring, you know, map problems to uh, to our siblings uh, as necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, really uh, understanding that, you know, AI is young. It's a young industry. It's, it's young science. As we sort of come to the foundational things that still need to be solved in explainability and assurance and, uh, you know, invertibility and, and uh, that we can sort of solve these jointly. It's not like we have each of our uh, research organizations, each working with their academic partners to, to figure out how to, to harden our, our own particular mission. So being able to bring sort of common visibility across those things that we are still working uh, jointly is a great space that I think uh, DNI could, uh, could bring uh, focus to. Uh, and then on that that metrics question, metrics. Uh, I, I do think, and I think Neil, you alluded to this a little bit. Uh, some of what would drive the best AI metrics are actually sort of the human metrics of how can we measure, and, and these are things that we need to figure out anyway. How effective our analysts are at their day to day jobs, and as we introduce new methods and new algorithms, how can we sort of measure? that human impact. And part of this is, you know, things like um, NSA, we're not an all source agency. So how are we better sharing our information across to our partners that are all source agencies? Um, how are we engaging our analysts in driving that data challenge of things like label data and annotations? Those are some, some easily, metri more easily uh, metricable things. Uh, but really at the end of the day, I think where I'd start anyway in the, Today, discussion around metricing, metricing our success in AI adoption, AI deployment is a little bit in that human aspect. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Great points. Um, Rachel, you're ready to dig in? Sure. 
Um, so, uh, the most promising application, I think, of, um, of, of AI within NGA is, I don't think will be sh shocking to anybody, but it, it's really going to be helping us shift, uh, shift our analytic brain power, right? We have some tremendously talented and, and smart people on some, um, you know, wonderful geo with wonderful geo and expertise, and we need to shift them from monitoring um, and, and move them to discovery and uh, to to being able to find you know the unknown unknowns and uh, being able to to deploy uh, you know AI or automation solutions on those some of those problem sets that are just the the static monitoring really does free them up um, to to go ahead and focus on those much more challenging problem sets you know it's I feel like everyone likes to think that once you put you know automate or you get some AI that means you suddenly don't need as many people. Um, to to work on the problem sets that you have, and I, I guess I would make the argument we've always had more mission than we've had people, and you know now this gives us the opportunity to really focus them um, to the best effect. Um, so so for for us in particular, you know, with the sort of the, the Earth is real big, so having AI to help us, uh, you know, to to oversee it uh, and show us show us the way will really do do wonders in in helping us advance our mission in, in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, I'll also just give a plug for, for Neil's answer as well on the natural language processing. That, that's another one, but I, I didn't want to copy, so I said something <laughs> else. Um, for us, the, the volume of, of historical data, again, the knowledge that's um, kind of stuck in unstructured text, uh, even, even where a company structured data, structured geoint, is really just tremendous. Um, and we need to figure a way how to leverage that um, to, uh, to, to really accelerate our work in, in terms of training models moving forward yeah. uh, second question was uh what does a what can ODNI do yeah uh, and uh, i think neil and jason touched on a lot of of sort of you know thoughts that i share in terms of um helping drive us towards community uh you know governance and, and interoperability I'll, mm -hmm. I'll add you know there's a lot of investment in some foundational uh, infrastructure and in data activities that probably still needs to happen but they're shareable expenses and uh, you know i'm sure we've all heard this quote um you know the the famous sue gordon quote we're individually we're all poor but together we have we have a lot of money um and you know there's really no reason for us to to um invest individually in capabilities that we can share easily so you know labeled training data is a really good example we're really committed to making sure that our our labeled data um you know once once we get more of it is available uh, for, for anyone to use in the community. It should be a community asset. Um, it's, a, it's a community resource. It's, it's there for anyone who wants to use it. And I know there, you know, that I, I know that's a, a sentiment that's shared by many people, but I think it's kind of something that's easier said than done sometimes. No one wants to pay to label data. It's really boring and not exciting. And it sounds, you know, like, you know, I don't want to do that, but I don't think you get to where, where we need to be without it, you know, yeah, there's synthetic data, there's other ways to get around it, but at the same time, you know, again, we have so much knowledge already trapped inside of our data. I, I, I would be concerned about what we would miss if we we're, you know, to rely solely on something like synthetic. So I think OD and I can help with those community investments um, and, and let us all, you know, maybe, you know, I'll, I'll pay a little bit towards the way instead of having to pay for it all ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, metrics for success, I think the best <laughs> metric for success is if in 10 years, nobody cares about AI. Um, <laughs> like honestly, no one, AI. I hope in ten or fifteen years should be like electricity, right? It's something we all know, we all have it, we use it, but we're not really worried about it because we know it it, it works, um, and we know we have access to it, and and you know we we understand how it gets to to our building. So that would be my my metric for success. That's a that's the biggest metric I think perhaps. Um, okay, so we have um, a, a question. A couple of people are really pinging on China questions right now. Um, one of the commissioners um, on the um, AI Commission, Gelman Louis, is with us. He's also a cyber brief expert, um, as well as Tom Higgins, um, who of course um, served for a number of years within the CIA and is now working um, in the private sector. Have asked similar questions. So when it comes to China. Um, where is Chinese artificial intelligence on the operating directive um, for the intelligence community? And Gilman asks, if there's no change in velocity, when do you expect China's AI capabilities for national security to surpass that of the United States? Um, Neil, I kind of, I think we're on a good little cycle here. Let's uh, let's start with you. I, 
they're, you know, both good questions. Um, I would maybe sort of zoom out and broaden it a little bit and offer that um, our adversaries adoption of AI ML technologies uh, mm -hmm. generally um, is separate and apart from our own development of AI technologies um, is an area that we need to be focused on, right? Um, how quickly they're developing um, the capabilities to adopt and deploy AI ML technologies, the purposes to which they're, um, they're, they are deploying those technologies um, and what it means for us, particularly um, for the three of us here for our intelligence mission, but for our national security more broadly. Um, the Chinese have certainly made um, large strides in this direction. Um, they, uh, they have uh, perhaps fewer um, restrictions in some ways uh, than, than we do um, here. Um, but we are certainly, uh, I would say, not just keeping pace, but, um, but staying ahead of, of uh, all of our uh, international um, partners and competitors alike on this front. Um, I do think um, counter and adversarial AI is going to be a topic that requires continuing attention going forward. Um, that is, um, how do our algorithms stack against our adversaries' algorithms? Um, mm -hmm. And how do we know um, when we are facing um, AI ML uh, deceit campaigns, for example? Um, I think those are all going to be uh, areas of significant interest and attention in the future. Yeah. Um, I, I love that question, Jason, though, um, where Gilman says, if there's not a change in velocity, when can uh, the U.S. kind of expect China's or an adversaries, to Neil's point, he's being um, very diplomatic, which is nice. Um, when should we be thinking that there's an issue here and the U.S. isn't investing enough and we're not moving quickly enough or we're not you know, providing what we need to to share information or all of the other things we talked about in terms of how we you know, tag or pull the information out quickly enough? How do we know? Yeah, so I, I think there, there are some things that, uh, you know, I, I'd like to, uh, A, maybe speak a little bit more broadly in this sort of global adversarial sense um, for, for, for now, I, I think. Um, one of the things that uh, we should focus on, and this relates back to uh, DNI Clapper's DNI question of uh, uh, how do we sort of maximize our ability sort of as a, a USIC against our adversaries? And part of this is going to be sort of working sort of as, uh, if, if not a unit, so, sort of being able to sort of maximally partner with each other um, across, again, the, the various authorities that, that we represent. Uh, and I, I think some of what we also want to coordinate on that we hadn't focused on yet is uh, where we have sort of unique strengths. And one of the things I'd, I'd love to be able to see us come together as an IC on is how do we coordinate on talent development? How do we you know, continue to pursue some of the, the best talent in uh, AIML uh, so that we can build a little bit of that technical headroom mm -hmm. internally within our agencies? I mean, there is this there is this global dynamic uh, in uh, AI ML adoption deployment, you know, across industry, across academia, there are these things that are sort of global outcomes that sort of raise all boats, right? As as kind of the, the, the global capabilities uh, uh, advance, uh, we as a nation certainly build on those, our adversaries build on those as well. We have unique opportunity to continue building headroom here with some of our unique engagements a across each other uh, as, as IC partners and, and some of our, our other partners. Uh, and then, you know, being able to build on some of the, the research capabilities that we represent with some of the, the unique data uh, activities that we, we also represent. So uh, it, is a, it, it is a very uh, dynamic, I don't want to say dire yet, uh, sort of global competition in this space. But there are things that we can do to, uh, to you know, keep our, maintain our advantage, as, as Neil alludes to. And I'm assuming that all of you have read the AI Commission report, I'm sure. And there are a number of, I think, specifics in there um, that call out sort of where the U.S. needs to be and how they need to be thinking about this moving forward in order to retain an edge over any adversary. I mean, to both your points, rightfully so. Um, Rachel, anything to add on that point? I have a bunch more questions. Uh, I'll, I'll just add something quickly, and then we can we can certainly move on to another question. Just that um, rather than focus on when they get there, focus on how they're getting there so quickly and um you know to the point of, of some of the nscai's 
recommendations, um, they have a lot fewer barriers between, you know, government and, and industry and in and, and public life. And um, some of those uh, don't necessarily result in good outcomes, you know, of course, but uh, what are we doing to impose barriers on ourselves to prevent, um, you know, a, a, a better synergy of, of brain power to, to get us moving faster? It would be the only thing I, I would posit as something we may want to, to focus on. Yeah, and I think getting back to Jason's point of talent development and, and you know, talent available here versus talent and our adversaries and how they're getting talent um, is, is an important point and one definitely worth focusing on. Um, an interesting question has come in um, from General Joe Votel um, regarding data tagging. He says he was at a DOD event um, just recently where all the discussion was largely focused on how you tagged information to make it useful for algorithms, which was a little bit surprising. So his question is, how is the IC going to go about data tagging at scale so they can make vast amounts of information usable and discoverable like industry must do as well? And I think off the top, all three of you mentioned that that's a really important issue. So how do you get there, I think, is the general's question. Um, anyone can take this on first. I would offer with, with a significant amount of focus uh, and investment. Um, it, it, the general is absolutely right. It, you know, I sometimes, it's not a perfect analogy, but sometimes say, you know, if your compute environment, your cloud environment is the engine and the algorithms are the dashboard or the controls that you put on the engine, the data is the fuel, right? And if you don't have the data right and it's not refined correctly, the engine doesn't work, right? And as I alluded to in my opening remarks, you know, one of the challenges in the IC is that we often don't uh, define the fields or the format or the tags for our data, right? We get, you know, as Rachel alluded to, historical data that we're trying to ingest, or we have data um, from a variety of sources where it comes in unstructured, unformatted in multiple languages, um, and getting that data right so that um, so that it is machine readable, if you will, so the algorithms can plug in and use it. Um, is a, a significant um, first step for us in being able to really, uh, really deploy and accelerate the deployment of AI ML solutions. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Jason or Rachel? Uh, I think Jason, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, uh, so General Vitel, uh, I think this notion of uh, tag data. Uh, I mean, that that certainly is. Our most expensive resource of going out to our, our you know, our, our very valuable analysts and, and invoking their time to, you know, annotate, you know, data to uh, annotate, you know, sort of the data they're working with to the, the levels of, uh, you know, curation fidelity that our, our al algorithms can use. Um, certainly, uh, less expensive than that, there are sort of the, the, this notion of, of weak labeled signals where, you know, we can take advantage of observing the things that our analysts are already doing and start starting to capture some data sets there. Um, and then uh, Rachel had alluded to some of the work on the NGA side with synthetic data. There's, those are things we can also do uh, at scale. But across all three of those, uh, <laughs> again, this goes back a little bit to, I think, that, that DNI question of, what we would love to be able to do is make sure across any of those sort of flavors of data that we maximize the interoperability and usable. And some of that is already uh, taking root a little bit in efforts like how do we sort of bring metadata alongside these, these data sets we're curating so that we can describe the usability or the intent or some of the other features of you know, biases or statistics with these data sets that can drive uh, the shareability and the, the cross-agency uh, usability of these data sets. Uh, I think that is one of the best ways for us as a community to, to maximize our, our data holdings. And just a quick note, um, Director Clapper um, appreciated the responses uh, from his earlier question, said they were all very thoughtful and consistent and that he loves Rachel's cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Rachel, um, what do you think? And any Anything to add on that point? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll double down on the the need for consistent, you know, interoperable data ontologies for labeling. Um, I think we are moving towards a, a standard in, in the community, but that effort I think could could probably be accelerated a little bit. Um, I, I'll add just to to add a new point onto the conversation. At the on the other side, right, as we get data in, you know, if it is not 
in a format is helpful if we do have to do a lot of work to make it usable if we are expending a lot of effort to do you know hand labeling or hand tagging because there's no resident you know no metadata coming in with it from from wherever it came from uh, we need a feedback loop to be able to go back to that those sources of information and help them be better at providing us data in a way that's usable for for analysts in, in much a much quicker fashion right i'm not saying every, it'll be perfect but there's certainly things we can look at doing to create that better feedback loop for, for the way we receive information. Mm -hmm. And here's a, here's a bit of a threat focused question from Ambassador Joe Detrani. Um, he asks, how concerned are you with the potential militarization of AI when you're looking at the broader national, national security picture? He says, especially if it operates in cyberspace with the potential to target, let's just say a nation's nuclear command and control system. Um, how concerned are you about that, the potential militarization of AI? Neil? So I alluded earlier to um, counter and adversarial AI as being a, a topic of, of focus and attention. And I think it, it needs to be. I think you can um, you know, conceive of several domains that, um, you know, that are often sort of um, tackled in the popular press where uh, AI can be applied in a, a militarized context. Um, you often hear about um, you know, sort of um, drone swarms and um, yeah. sort of uh, and, and, and automated self-driven weapon systems. Um, but Ambassador Tranny puts his finger on, you know, another, uh, another important question, which is on the cyber front, right? Um, uh, I would say even beyond militarized AI, there's also just more generally the weaponization of AI, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's um, in support of, um, of influence campaigns or operations um, through deep fakes um, or, more broadly. Um, so it, it definitely is an area uh, that I think requires continued focus and attention um, and one that will be of concern going forward. Mm -hmm. And Jason, any anything to throw in on this one? Uh, so yeah, there is definitely in that cyberspace of just the, the uh, opportunity for uh, dynamic effects in ways uh, that are much less observable. So yes, we we do need to be very focused in this space. You know, uh, uh, sh shoring up uh, and heavily investing in our defensive capabilities on this front. Um, and maybe I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and Rachel, I'm assuming since NGA really, um, you know, one of your uh, clients for your intelligence products is DoD, that uh, this is something pretty much on your radar. Yeah, absolutely. Rachel. I, what I'll say is, though, I think DoD has been very forward-leaning and trying to be transparent about the way that they have that they are moving towards, you know, ethical AI, responsible mm -hmm. AI. Um, you know, one of the first things the Joint AI Center focused on um, was was you know AI ethics. Um, working really closely with DoD to put that out as a memo as well, so that it would be, um, and I, I believe it was almost exactly adopted by the IC as well. But you know, I, they've been really uh, out front about trying to be clear about what the rules of engagement are, or how we should be using AI in an ethical way from from an operational perspective. Um, so I'm, I, you know, I, I think that they're that they are aware of the of that of that issue, and they're making sure that they are taking the steps to, um, you know, prevent something unfortunate from happening in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I can't believe that um, almost an hour has gone by because, I, I, I mean, there are so many questions, really thoughtful, smart questions that people have written and that we haven't even gotten to yet. But I'm going to throw one more of these out at you and then um, I'm going to come around and I want to give each of you the opportunity, given sort of the conversation that we've had today, to come back to us with some closing thoughts about how to think about the future and next steps when it comes to AI and the U.S. national security mission. So this question is from John Davis. Um, what do you consider essential? And, and he said man on the loop. And John, don't let me offend you, but I'm going to say human in the loop because um, there are a lot of smart women out there too. Um, <laughs> functions, and I know you didn't mean it that way. Functions in respect to AI-enabled processes, and how do your architectures design in support? Um, he says MITL exception handling. So I'm going to have to ask you what that means because I am not I am not as in the weeds. Um, but do you want me to repeat the question or? So, so basically, how are you thinking of the essential human in the loop where you have to have that person? And Neil, you talked a little bit like right off the top during your introductory comments that that, that is not a relationship that's ever going to go away um, and how important it is in understanding getting that balance right. So how do you look at that in respect to AI enabled processes and how the architectures are designed? And I'm sure I botched the question, John, sorry. <laughs> 
so I, I would, rather than sort of speaking about specific architectures and their design, I, I would say, you know, that I think what's actually most important is putting the processes in place, those governance processes, you know, so that we know um, and can make smart decisions about where we're adopting AI ML solutions, mm -hmm. um, how we know, uh, how we can have assurance in uh, the solutions, the answers that those AML solutions are producing, um, how we know that our algorithms are secure, um, how we determine sort of the ethical application um, of AI in our mission. Um, and that, you know, I think once we do that, once we have those processes in place uh, and we can run use cases through those processes, uh, we'll be able to determine, um, you know, sort of how much confidence we have in those AI ML solutions and when we need to have uh, a role for um, for humans in the loop. Mm -hmm. That's a very thoughtful answer. Jason or Rachel, any anything to add? Yeah, this is actually a, a space that I would probably lean into a little bit in, in closing remarks of. Uh, we, we are still young in this as an enterprise, and really where we are looking next is uh, how we can drive effective human machine teaming. So this sort of uh, human in the loop, part of this is, right, how are our analysts with all the processes they have you know, doing their in their day-to-day jobs today, uh, how do we get them working with a little bit more higher fidelity AI enabled uh, analytics, applications, agents? How are they give, how are they giving back to those those uh, analytics and systems? Part of this is a little bit in that instrumentation and metricing of how effectively are our analysts uh, working in sort of this this human machine uh, mm -hmm. partnership? Uh, and I, I might have drifted a little bit from from <laughs> the question, but uh, in this uh, uh, human in, in the loop sense, uh, part of this really is where we are in kind of the maturity right now is that is probably where we can lean in next uh, to, to Neil's comment a little bit of shaping kind of the governance policies. You know, some of the human machine teaming is going to be a little bit with, you know, our policymakers or our policy leads and our decision makers. So it isn't all just sort of analysts in the loop. Um, but <laughs> We will have to move from there into things that aren't necessarily human time kinds of activities again in sort of you know dynamic low latency cyber kinds of missions. But uh, today, like leaning into sort of that that human machine engagement is really a, a good place for us to focus. It's going to be that balance. Um, so you have to forgive me on the whole like um, female male thing, but I saw Black Widow last night, and I'm not about to. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, open up the chat box for that. Um, that'll be a whole different session, but. Um, there we go. Okay, let, let's just move on to closing remarks. And Rachel, I want to start with you. Um, how are we thinking about, and how are you respectively with NGA in particular, thinking about the future, the near future, and then the longer term future in order for the US and particularly the NGA to help the US strengthen national security when it comes to the implementation of artificial intelligence? Sure. So I guess um, my focus has been, um, and I think the or the future focus that I'm that I'm that I'm looking at, um, and that I tell our industry partners when they ask, hey, what should we, what should we be looking at in the future for NGA? Uh, I think we've done we're doing a good job as a community and doing things like building governance and understanding, you know, what what are good missions to deploy AI or automation. But um, you know, with maybe a few exceptions, I don't know that we've really deployed a lot of models at scale. Um, mm -hmm. We don't really have enterprise AI, I don't think, and I, I think that when we do, we're going to find there's a lot more work that we need to do in terms of um, those kinds of machine learning operations. And so it's not just, you know, build the build the model once and let it run, and then you're you know you're you're good and golden. But there's there's a lot of maintenance that is different, I think, from the kind of normal maintenance you would expect, you know, from from maybe more traditional software processes that requires a constant focus on development and, and a constant sort of re-examination for things like adversarial AI, um, for 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 um, efforts for denial and deception on our adversaries' part, you know, to make sure there's no data drift, to make sure that the model is still providing the right results. And, and so I think, you know, to the earlier question, you'll always have a human in the loop in that respect, but I don't know that we've really considered what that means 
for the community at an at, at enterprise level. That's a lot of time and investment and focus on AI models. And, and I, I would say that my focus at NGA will be, you know, how do we start bringing in those practices so that when we get to scale, we are able to actually, you know, be, be very um, modern in our approach to, to, to those kinds of operations. Mm -hmm. Jason, moving forward, what are you, uh, how is NSA thinking about this? I'd like to echo uh, Rachel's comments and how do we focus on AI development deployment as an enterprise. So uh, back to this notion of how do we bring in talent and how do we capitalize on the talent we do bring in. Uh, one of the, the best ways we can uh, sort of keep our AI momentum moving forward is to streamline our development. So our, our developers and our researchers and our tradecraft you know, specialists uh, don't have the barriers uh, of you know data access or you know even just sort of the guardrails of policy and compliance as they're trying to do their their mission work. So as much as we can uh, enable AI development across our enterprise, you know building in ready access to toolkits, uh, libraries, uh, you know a compliance APIs, uh, data accesses, so that um, our our data scientists and developers can be as effective as as they need to be to do their work. Mm -hmm. And uh, Neil, looks like CIA gets the final word on this one today. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, so the agency, uh, we're executing an agency-wide strategy uh, to create an environment for our AI systems to flourish. Um, from the bottom up, we're examining both existing and new initiatives um, to identify independent interdependencies, um, gaps, and risks. Um, just to give you sort of four um, four points along those lines and, and really focus on the fourth. Um, we're focused on building and sustaining an AI ready workforce um, to help us shape and integrate AI ML solutions into all aspects of our business. Um, creating the technical environment um, for those AI solutions to flourish, um, which includes both um, that, that migration to the cloud into a multi-cloud solution and getting all of our data right. Um, mm -hmm. Third, we're working to update policies on security, data management, and acquisition, um, and focusing on the ethical use of AI. Um, last but not least, and I suspect of, of interest um, to some of the, the folks joining us today, we're also focused on maximizing our partnerships, um, not just across the IC and with academia, um, but with industry too. Um, there have been fields in the past where government was the lead innovator or the primary creator. Um, and really in AI, in many instances, government needs to be a fast follower. Um, we need to partner with industry um, to identify um, the innovation that's occurring in the private sector um, and put ourselves in a position where we can identify those best of breed commercially available solutions that are already out there and bring them into our ecosystem as quickly as possible. Um, mm -hmm. At CIA, um, we have opened uh, unclassified facilities in both Silicon Valley and in the Northern Virginia Dulles Corridor, where we can go out and meet with companies with a focus on AI ML in an unclassified environment, removing some of the hurdles to working with the IC. Uh, and we're really trying to to leverage um, to leverage uh, those facilities, those outposts, um, to really, um, as I say, take advantage of our migration to the cloud um, to bring in some of those best of breed solutions. Um, and, and really take advantage of some of the innovation that's occurring in industry. Um, as I said at the beginning, it is for us um, central um, to our ability to keep pace uh, with the threats we face going forward and to provide policymakers with the intelligence and insights that they require. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a huge focus, as I mentioned right off the top for the Cypher Brief as well, with the, the partnerships, the public-private partnerships are really the only way forward. That's not even an option anymore. And I think, um, you know, that's one of the reasons that we do what we do down at Sea Island um, in Georgia, which we're doing in late October this year. And I hope everyone is able to, to benefit um, from those sessions. Rachel, Jason, Neil, thank you all so much for this absolutely excellent brief. We are so grateful for your time. Um, we're also very grateful to Microsoft Federal, who was the sponsor of this particular series of events, um, their commitment to making sure we were able to bring them to you. It is a competitive environment, but there is one uh, area when we're all on the same side, and I think that comes to national security. So we very much appreciate um, all of the public and private uh, people who 
get involved in helping us think this through and, and make sure that we have a clear path forward for development and for how those public-private companies uh, can work together in the future. So thank you all. Um, I do want to um, say that we uh, will be presenting in the Cyberbreeze Morning Newsletter um, some interesting and exciting news coming up about a new cyber initiatives group that's also going to focus on tech. Um, so look for that in the next few days. You all are the very first to hear about it. Um, we're excited to announce that. So thank you so much. It was really a pleasure to be able to see everyone today. Um, we appreciate everyone's involvement and we look forward to continuing these conversations on the Cypher Brief. Thanks everyone. <laughs>